Hello everybody, this is Dr. Cole. It's Saturday afternoon, May 7th. This will be my last message of the term for you. Uh, we're supposed to be on an eight-week term, but we're going to call this week 10. This is our 10th message to you for Political Science 1013 for the second eight-week term uh, for spring 2022. Everyone, what we have left are the term papers and the final exam. Um, I've gotten one, maybe more than one paper. Remember, papers are not absolutely mandatory, but if you submit one, it could help you raise a low grade. Uh, if you would like to submit a term paper, try to have it to me by Thursday, and then I can get the papers read, marked, and graded in time to turn grades in one week from today, uh, Saturday, May 14th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, the final exam will be Monday and Tuesday, the 9th and 10th, for 48 hours. You'll have that 48-hour window to take the exam. The material will be Unit 7 and 8, okay? The class notes for Unit 7 and 8, and in addition to that, we gave you four articles to read and expect 10 or 15 items based on those four articles. Uh, everybody, let me say just a little bit about the course material, especially Unit 8 on Congress. We had tried to address Unit 7 on the Supreme Court last time. You have one article about the political nature of the Supreme Court, and the other three articles you have to look at deal with Congress, which is the longer of the two units, Unit 8. Uh, let me very quickly run through what we try to do in Unit 8. We talk about the kind of people who are elected to Congress and how Congress has been predominated by white males, although it's become somewhat more diverse with the passage of time. We also wanted to go through the members of Congress from Oklahoma and surrounding states so that people would have an idea of who their representatives in Congress were. We talk about congressional elections to a, to a considerable extent because how elections are conducted have a good deal to do with how they behave once they get to Congress because they've always, of course, most of them got an eye to the next election. And we try to emphasize that they, they are pretty much on their own, although they run as representatives of a party, they're pretty much on their own when it comes to fundraising and conducting their campaigns. We discuss the kind of things that members do to perpetuate themselves in office. Uh, not many, many members are defeated. Most members who run for re-election get re-elected. We talk to a considerable extent about how members try to maintain lines of communication with their constituents, and we draw upon the contributions there of political scientist Richard Fenno. Then in the second part of the unit, we talk about the leadership and structure of Congress, the leadership positions such as Speaker of the House and several others that, that are mentioned there. We talk about the committee and subcommittee system in Congress, the process by which a bill becomes law. Uh, we talk about such matters as the filibuster and the budget as an exceptional kind of piece of legislation that has to be passed every year, although very often in the past couple of decades they've been late in, in, uh, in passing it. Okay. Uh, we talk about the views of English statesman Edmund Burke on whether the legislator ought to be a trustee or a delegate. Then we try to sum up the course as a whole and where we stand now in the spring of 2022, moving to a midterm election in November and another presidential election in 2024 with everything that is going on that is roiling American politics at this time. Now, the readings you have for uh, the final exam, we mentioned the one on the Supreme Court that we had touched on last time. Everybody, what these readings try to address, we talk about in the class notes the committee and subcommittee system, and the process by which a bill generally becomes law. That's what members of Congress on Capitol Hill refer to as regular order. But one thing that has been going on in Congress for the past couple of decades is more and more they have gotten away from regular order because they are so evenly divided. Very often uh, legislation gets stuck in committee and if important legislation had to go through the regular committee and subcommittee process, it might never make it to the floor of the House and Senate. So on something like the budget, 
or perhaps a handful of other pieces of major legislation that we could mention. Very often what happens is agreement is reached between the White House and the leadership of the two parties in the House and the Senate. They agree on the content of a bill and forward those bills directly to the floor of the House and the Senate without it going through regular order, the regular committee and subcommittee system. Now, the reason for that, well, one of the articles you have to read from the Pew Research Center discusses the matter of polarization in Congress. The fact that Republicans and Democrats in Congress are so starkly divided and there's very little overlap in their views anymore. Uh, when I was your age, there would have been far more liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats in Congress. There are very few of them anymore. Senator Manchin of West Virginia is one of the few uh, conservative Democrats who got elected with views somewhat out of step of the rest of his or her party. Okay, So when there's very little overlap between their views, they find it difficult to come to an agreement and get legislation passed. So very often, it's become something of a problem in the eyes of many of them in the past couple of decades. They've had to abrogate regular order and bring bills directly to the floor of the House and Senate. And that's uh, been something of a headache and a concern to members and observers of Congress for some time now. Um, your second piece by Ms. Seegers from the New Republic mentions a kind of a vicious cycle that Congress and the other branches of government have gotten into. Uh, matters on which there's a feeling that legislation needs to be passed. Now, there will always be those who, who will insist, well, maybe we're better off not passing any legislation. But very often, Congress finds itself stymied attempting to pass legislation because it is so evenly divided. Then, when, as so often is the case, it turns out that legislation can't be passed, uh, your article mentions, for instance, the Build Back Better bill, the proposal for large items of federal spending on so-called social programs, also alternative energy, that President Biden wanted to get passed but appears will not get passed in anything resembling its original form. Uh, when legislation like that is blocked and cannot make, it way, makes it, make its way through Congress, the president will come under pressure to try to deal with those matters by executive action or executive order instead. But the question then arises, does the president have authority to do that? Okay. The justices that President Trump appointed to the Supreme Court, along with some who served longer than that, those appointed by Republican presidents, tend to take a skeptical view of presidential power and the executive branch and governmental power in general. They tend to be very skeptical and wonder whether presidential actions have not overstepped the legitimate authority of the president as given to the president in the Constitution. So if uh, the president takes an action, issues an order, and it's uh, challenged in court, if it should go all the way to the Supreme Court, the court may find that the president did not have authority to take that action. Then we have to state our start all over again. All that can be done, perhaps, is to try to have Congress pass legislation. But once again, Congress may be too evenly divided to get legislation passed at all. So we get into kind of a vicious cycle in the view of some people. At least that's the view of, presented in the article by Grace Seegers from the New Republic, which is the second one on Congress that we assigned to you. Then finally, we have an article from the New York Times that discusses the revival of the practice of earmarks. Now, your class notes mention that earmarks had been brought to a halt going back to the year 2010 and 2011. Okay, Republicans controlled the House of Representatives at least at that time, and they wanted to halt the practice of earmarks. Earmarks refer to items of spending that are inserted into legislation by a particular member to benefit that member's own district or state. Okay, now, as you read that article, it mentions that uh, sometimes Earmarks, uh, the feeling in Congress is that earmarks are sometimes a way to kind of grease the wheels of Congress and make it easier to get things done. Okay? You can persuade a member to go along if you offer that member something that he can then go, he or she can then take credit for and brag about back home in the home district or the home state. Okay? So earmarks have been brought back. They're called something a little different now. They're under some constraints, but members 
uh, to place any number of items in the most recent budget, adding up to quite a bit of money, although a small, small fraction of all the money spent in the budget, because the practice of particular items of spending inserted by a member into a budget has been defied. Now, in the decade or so that had passed, members very often found ways to get around that. They, instead of getting something put in legislation, they might simply try to browbeat the bureaucracy into spending some money in their particular district or state. Or at least that's what we're told from reports that have come out. But the formal practice of earmarks, although they've been renamed, are coming back now in the year 2022, something we've been doing without for about a decade, although members have tried to find ways to get around that. But earmarks have been revived, and you'll read quite a bit about different members' views on the practice of earmarks. Some people frown upon them, Others think they're a, a good idea for getting something good done in Congress. All right, everybody. So that is our material for the final exam. Unit 7 and 8. Unit 7 on the Supreme Court, Unit 8 on Congress. Uh, plus the four articles that you were assigned. You expect 10 or 15 items from those articles. The exam will be up and available to you for a 48-hour window. Monday and Tuesday, uh, May 9th and 10th. And then if anyone doing term papers, please try to get them to me by Thursday. Please contact me with any issues or problems you might be having, and we'll try to get those resolved before grades are turned in uh, Saturday afternoon, a week from the day, the 14th, at 4.30 p.m. So let me know if there's anything that I can do for you. I try to check my mail first thing every morning, my email. We'll try to get any problems resolved. Otherwise, I hope... 1013 has been a good experience to you, for you, and has opened your eyes to some of the things going on behind the scenes in our political system, roiled as it is by so many problems and issues these days. So uh, good luck, good luck on the exam. Hope everyone does as well as possible, and we hope that Political Science 1013 has been an eye-opening experience for you for the spring term 2022. Take it easy.